Okay. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, big welcome, especially to our uh, distinguished panelists. We have Anita McGann, Jim Walsh, and Paul Adler joining us today. Um, and big welcome to all of you who are tuning in. Um, thank you so much for being here. This is the International Humanistic Management Association pre-conference. It's an initiative of the um, Prime Working Group on Humanistic Management, and it's supported by the Humanistic Management Centers Consortium, which is a group of um, business ethics and social responsibility centers globally um, that wants to promote and provoke the types of ideas um, that we'll be discussing today. I'm Erica Steckler from the University um, of Massachusetts Lowell and the Donahue Center for Business Ethics and Social Responsibility. I'm joined by several colleagues from the Humanistic Management Association. I know Michael Pearson is here, David Wasilewski is here, I know Sandra Waddock's here, I think uh, Elizabeth Castillo and others are here. I can't see all of you. Um, I'm going to turn it very briefly over to Michael and then we'll jump straight back in. Uh, Michael, if you don't mind just saying a few things about EMA um, and then we'll jump straight into the, into the session. Well, thank you, Erica, and thank you, Anita, Paul, and Jim. And this has been a continuous conversation that we're trying to foster because the assumption is for the Humanistic Management Association that we need a new way of seeing and a new way of being to manage our affairs better. We just had a brief conversation and, and the panelists all share a, a uh, dark shirt because it's dark time possibly. <laughs> On the other hand, I think we have the capacity to really do a better job. It may not be that hard, but we also need to do a deep dive into why we're here, where we are, and, and how we can get out of here. So these conversations that the Humanistic Management Associations uh, is featuring are supposed to be hopeful in getting at, at ways that we can protect our own dignity, the dignity of life, and promote flourishing which I know we're sort of drifting away from. So I just wanted to give you that as a context and as a platform and invite you all also to be part of that. So thanks again for being here. Wonderful, thank you. So again, welcome. Um, this is the International Humanistic Management Association's pre-conference for Tuesday. Um, and we're discussing revisioning global transformation for humanistic management and organizing. And we're joined by three renowned management scholars, um, experts um, in our field, Anita McGann from the University of Toronto, Paul Adler from, from the University of Southern California, and Jim Walsh from the University of Michigan, and each deserves a far more um, detailed um, introduction, but I would encourage you all to please go to their website, see their personal statements, and you'll very quickly understand why it's such a privilege and an honor to have all three of them here with us today. Um, so we are focused on the super wicked problems of our time. And we're hoping that we can take a look at this with new eyes, with new perspectives, um, and understand some of these grand challenges from very specific perspectives, the crisis of capitalism, immigration, and even if we dig a little bit deeper, our own responsibility um, in terms of our fallibilities perhaps as humans. Uh, so we'll be addressing all three of these things. And um, again, I, I encourage you all to go to Anita, Jim, and Paul's websites um, and, and spend some time also with some of their literatures. Um, so let's kick off. I'm just going to grab some of our prompts. And I'd like to start with Anita, if that's OK with everybody. Um, so immigration, let's start with that as one of our wicked problems. How do you think about this as a management issue? And what suggestions do you have for how management and specifically how we as management scholars can begin to address this? So thanks so much for uh, being here, everyone, and for the wonderful introduction, Erica and Michael, and for all you're doing for our field, which is tremendous. So uh, I think of immigration as a, a, a grand challenge, as uh, one of the most important issues of our time. I see Jim is on uh, the call here. He's passionate about climate change, of course. Uh, uh, tremendously important as well. And the arguments that I've been making in the journals about uh, immigration tend to run along the following lines. You know, business in many, uh, businesses in many industries profit from the immigration of, of people, uh, not just as knowledge workers, but to escape war, famine, uh, poverty, prosecution. And in fact, my argument is that we ha face a moral and humanitarian and social imperative as people. Uh, 
to deploy our best capabilities as management scholars uh, to deal with this, the implications of this fact. Um, the background is that in our field, a lot of work in management and economics uh, and other fields looks at the diffusion of knowledge across country boundaries. There's been work on diaspora, but most of this work is relatively focused on, um, on the implications for companies uh, uh, and, and the profitability and competitiveness of companies of the diffusion of knowledge or of the diffusion of people as entrepreneurs or uh, as, as sources of talent across international boundaries. The, the, the work tends to be, I, I have argued, you know, profit oriented. It's focused on what people bring to companies and how companies, um, you know, for example, uh, uh, knowledge-based companies, uh, uh, pharmaceutical companies, for example, profit from scientific knowledge that may move across boundaries and so on. But the much more prevalent event of uh, immigration is not uh, the migration of a knowledge worker uh, across an international boundary. The, the phenomenon that's much more prevalent is migration for survival. Uh, we don't uh, even really know very much about the implications for the people behind the knowledge flows of their immigration experience. And our work to date in the literature in the field of management has tended to be have this kind of clinical kind of quality to it, this idea that it's we're dispassionate bystanders that are looking at how you know, firms profit from these kinds of activities here. And uh, in this paper that I recently wrote, I, I um, raised these questions of, what about looking at immigration on its own terms uh, as both a process and an event and examining how companies profit along each stage of the immigration process uh, here and, and why they profit and how they profit. Um, I've asked uh, questions like of what drives people to immigrate in the first place and um, how do companies get in, engaged with that. And in, in, this work, in this paper that I've recently published, I've, I've focused actually on my own immigration experience in contrast with that of my grandparents. I immigrated as a scientist from the United States to Canada under the very best of circumstances. I was uh, sponsored by a university. I have all these resources, you know, I have an education. Um, and it was still very hard. And I would say in some ways my immigration to Canada failed. And it failed because I never really got integrated into Canadian society uh, in the way that uh, was envisioned. As a knowledge worker, I believe that I've contributed to Canadian society, but I don't think that I, that, that, that every advantage that could have been had by my immigration has been had. Even with all that privilege, my immigration stands in contrast to that of my grandparents who were fleeing famine and war uh, a century earlier to come across the Atlantic from Ireland primarily to the United States, certainly from across Europe to the United States. If you think about the challenges of immigrants, both in the last century and in this century across time, over time, there are at least four stages where companies engage. The first is in the decision whether or not to go. And uh, I've done some work on human trafficking. One of my grandfathers, uh, uh, great grandfathers actually, Tim Scanlon, uh, left Ireland uh, to come to the United States under a promise of employment by the Macy's Corporation that was not fulfilled when he arrived. He also uh, had difficulty at the second uh, point of the process, which is actually uh, how he was handled as he arrived in the United States. There's a lot of attention that's been in the press recently about illegal handling uh, handling uh, by illegal traffickers, but there's also a lot of profit in the legal handling of immigration, lawyers, accountants, movers, uh, all the people that are involved in profiting from uh, the application process. Another one of my grandfathers and I both paid thousands of dollars to get a representation to become uh, citizens, naturalized citizens of the countries to which we uh, were immigrated, uh, in, into which we immigrated. And th those profits, I don't think, have been fully interrogated. And the incentives that those profits create haven't been fully interrogated by our field. The event of crossing the border also has enormous implications for the future productivity of work. a worker. Uh, you know, if, if any little thing goes wrong with the paperwork or something like that, even in the process of the most advantaged immigration, I'm interested in Paul's experience in this domain, you know, you can spend years trying to fix that. You know, you don't get access to a bank account, a driver's license, healthcare insurance, unless everything go goes well. 
uh, here. That means that a lot of immigrants get put into the informal economy, uh, perhaps temporarily, perhaps permanently, uh, because there are so many things that can go wrong in the process of uh, crossing a border. We haven't interrogated that at all. And then, you know, you lay on top of that the kinds of policies that the United States, my home country, has been implementing, that changes in the policies, policies that are inhumane, uh, the implications of that for someone's lifetime of uh, experience have not been in interrogated in the management literature uh, systematically. And then um, post-immigration uh, experience as well. You know, uh, we have some research on entrepreneurship by immigrants, but it, again, very clinical. It doesn't deal with the actual immigrant experience fully. Uh, there's a lot of uh, work to do to try to understand this. And the big message that I'm hoping to send in my, uh, in my work in this domain is, you know, we have responsibilities at manage, as management scholars, but also as people to bring our best capabilities uh, to the service of those who uh, uh, are affected by the ideas that we engage. Uh, are we doing our work in the service of uh, those who profit from immigration or the immigrants themselves? I think it's uh, an important question that we need to address. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to now turn to Paul. So from immigration to the crises of capitalism. Could you briefly summarize your six ideas about these crises or these six crises and how do you suggest overcoming them? Thank you. I'm really delighted to be with you all this morning. Um, what, a, uh, what a terrific um, audience and what a terrific group of panelists. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this. I'm really honored and um, let me try to summarize some of the ideas that I presented in this book that I published recently. Um, it's a public facing book called The 99% Economy, where I try to address some of the issues that I think are uh, the focus of our discussion here today. And yeah, I began with um, six big problems that I thought of. I, I love your expression in framing the session today uh, around super wicked problems, because I think that's a good description of the problems that I focused on in the book that I published. Um, economic irrationality, um, workplace disempowerment, government's unresponsiveness to popular demand, environmental unsustainability, um, social disintegration, and international conflict. Um, I think the international migrations that uh, Anita was just talking about uh, encapsulate many of these, or several of these problems all at once. Um, environmental unsustainability is going to be a massive source of international migrations coming in the, into the, in the future, social disintegration within the home countries and the uh, difficulties of the host countries in absorbing integration, uh, in absorbing new immigrants and contributing to social disintegration there. International conflict, these are all major sources of the massive Im immigration flows that we're going to be dealing with in the coming decades. So in, the, in, in my book and in my thinking, I've tried to uh, focus on understanding the source of these problems and what we can do about them. Um, premised on the assumption, I must say, <laughs> it's maybe not an obvious assumption, but premised on the assumption that uh, it really doesn't have to be this way. We, we have the resources in the world around us uh, to enable us all to live a dignified life. And there's something obscene about the fact that we live in a world where, what is it, eight people in the world today control more wealth than the bottom half of the entire planet. Um, the, the obscenity of a world characterized by these super wicked problems that we're talking about at a time when nothing should stand in the way of well-being and dignity for everybody. That obscenity uh, keeps me awake at night. So in trying to understand the sources of these problems, I, I find myself peeling back layers of explanation. Um, obviously, there's lots of bad decisions, lots of corrupt leaders, uh, lots of venal motives that contribute to these crises. Um, if you scrape away the surface and dig a little further, um, I, I love the Toyota five whys technique for problem solving. So here am I, my, my second why, you know, why these bad decisions, why these bad leaders? You, many people argue we, we, we suffer from a lack of regulation and a degradation of ethical norms in the leadership of our businesses and, uh, and governments. If you push a little further down the five whys path of interrogation, a lot of people find themselves interrogating the neoliberalism, neoliberal form of capitalism that's prevailed since the 1980s. 
that's ratcheted back the role of government in our everyday lives, have privatized, outsourced government services, uh, freed up corporations to abuse their employees and their suppliers. Um, that's not a bad diagnosis. I don't think it takes us far enough, though, because I do think that beyond the neoliberal form of capitalism that's been so toxic and destructive, um, it's capitalism itself that generates these problems, these super wicked problems we're talking about. I just don't see how, as long as we live in a society whose economy is, has that basic capitalist form, um, I don't see how we can avoid any of the six of the big problems that we face. Um, what do I mean by capitalism? Nothing very controversial in my understanding of it. Private enterprises compete for profits as opposed to cooperating under some shared plan. Workers are treated as employees. They're hired and fired as a function of the needs of the enterprise, as opposed to being citizens that co-govern the enterprise in which they work, and indeed govern the economy as a whole. And then the third feature of capitalism, as I see it, is um, a bit more controversial, but I think fairly rather mainstream, my understanding of it. Government's rather separate from and dependent on the wealth generated by the private sector economy. Um, and as compared to a system, I'll call it socialism, in, in which uh, government is the, uh, owns the means of production, the, the, the means by which we live, and enterprises and planners in those enterprises are accountable to the citizenry for their decisions. Um, so I think of capitalism as the root cause and socialism as the cure. Um, if I have to take one example to motivate my, the, the, such an extreme, extremely different uh, vision of the, of the future we, we should be fighting for, um, the one example I often find myself coming back to is our environmental crisis. Um, we all know the roots of the environmental crisis uh, in a capitalist economy, enterprises are free absent government regulation, to the contrary, to treat the external world as a dumping ground and as a, as a source of materials to be plundered. Externalities is the technical term for the, for, for the problem, and regulation is ostensibly the answer. Well, the problem is that we've so badly damaged the environment and we're damaging it at an ever accelerating rate, that at this point, there's simply no way we can transform our economy to become sustainable in an environmental sense. Uh, absent some very radical transformation of our basic infrastructure. No, we're not going to solve this problem with a carbon tax of $50 a ton or even $250 a ton. It's going to require that we not only shut down the entire fossil fuel industry, but radically restructure a whole swath of industries, uh, everything from agriculture to cement to plastics to pharmaceuticals to construction. And on top of that, we're going to have to rebuild an enormous proportion of our basic infrastructure to deal with the massive attacks that nature is going to unleash on us uh, in rising sea levels and storms and so forth. So, yes, there are some industries that will find that profitable, solar perhaps, um, but for the vast bulk of industry, this is a massive hit to profitability, an unsustainable hit to their profitability. So we have many colleagues in business school who... Uh, very conscious of the environmental challenge we face, argue uh, in favor of a more ethical, socially and, eth and environmentally responsible form of capitalist enterprise. And you'll forgive me if I find that argument almost, uh, well, uh, upsettingly thin, <laughs> because there's simply no way we can seriously respond to the magnitude and the urgency of this environmental challenge by relying on the goodwill of companies like, uh, like Patagonia. Uh, Yvonne Chouinard himself says Patagonia is an unsustainable company. Of course, it's unsustainable. Let's not be, fool ourselves here. We're trying to be a little less unsustainable. But the, the kind of uh, voluntary action of industry is never going to get us where we need to go fast enough. So many people turn to government, uh, as I was saying before. The standard response to these problems of externality is stronger regulation. Um, and I don't see how that gets us there either. As long as the core of the economy is a is a capitalistic core based on firms that rely on profits to attract investment funds. No government can enforce regulations of the magnitude of the severity that we need uh, without undercutting the economic viability of the, of the business sector. And the business sector will fight back. It'll refuse to invest. 
jobs will job losses will uh, will multiply uh, capital will flee the country and so bottom line i don't see any way in which uh, a kind of social democratic model can get us where we need to go a social democratic model in which we have strong government trying to regulate and and and, and manage the behavior of a capitalistic private sector that is not a viable model if we're going to deal with the truly wicked problems that we face in the future. So yes, I don't see any option but to move to a democratically controlled uh, uh, economy where we plan what we want to do together at a national and for that matter international anima, uh, level where we socialize the ownership of these productive resources um, and work out what the plan's objectives are for the coming five years. I know the idea of a five-year plan frightens the bejesus out of a lot of people on this call, but I, I think we could find a way to make the idea of some sort of collective planning process of that kind uh, very meaningful, attractive, and give a sense of purpose across entire society. So um, the, uh, it's the, I do think it, we need to envisage this planning at a pretty comprehensive scale, at a national and indeed international scale, to deal with these wicked problems we face. I don't think this happens, I don't think we can meet the challenges we face of these super wicked problems by purely local, uh, informal uh, interactions. And so we, we face a big challenge in finding a way to democratize uh, our the way we manage our societies, extending the realm of, of democratic decision rights from the political realm to the economic realm. And in my book, what I try to do is make that idea uh, less threatening for people and, and, and easier to imagine by looking at some of the planning processes within some of our biggest corporations. Many people have observed over the years that the big capitalist corporation operates internally a bit like a planned socialist economy. And so in my book, The 99% Economy, I try to dig into the experience of some of these big companies I've had a chance to study and extract from them a model of planning that is indeed participative as well as providing that uh, unity of purpose uh, across the entire organization. My argument being that if that model of strategic management that, we've, that, we've, that we all teach in many of our classes on strategic management, we could imagine uh, scaling it up to manage the entire industry, the entire region, the entire nation's economy, uh, and give it more democratic robustness, um, ensure through constitutional means uh, the, the many of the democratic qualities we want this planning to have through multi-party political systems, freedom of the press, a new constitution that would protect the right to minorities, but not the rights, the right to, uh, to, to assert monopoly control over society means, society's means of production. And in that way, I try to sketch out a, a model of what this democratic socialist form of society might look like, which to go back to the beginning, seems to me, realistically speaking, uh, the only way that we're gonna get on top of these super wicked problems we face. So let me stop there and ha hand it back, thank you. Thank you, and we'll circle back to, to several uh, discussion questions that have come up. Um, thank you very much. Now, moving from the very, very macro to the much more micro. Um, Jim, I'd love to know your thoughts, if you don't mind sharing them with all of us, about how we might transform our own relationships to super wicked problems when we think about ourselves. Can you unmute? Please. Yes, I can. <laughs> I'm not a complete idiot. <laughs> it takes me a while, though. Um, uh, like everyone else, it's just uh, such a joy to wake up on a what's today Tuesday morning, Wednesday Tuesday morning, and see 200 people out here. Um, the uh, downside of that is my I'm just at home on my Wi-Fi, and I'm coming in and out with some people, and I'm really hoping that this will sustain us in the next uh, next hour or however long we're going to be here. Um, what I'd like to do is, uh, is do two things, I suppose, is one, I would like to um, uh, assert that, we, that everybody on this uh, call are organizational scholars of one kind or another. And so um, that's intrigued me as to what's, what's the, how do we as a field find ourselves dealing with these questions today? And for uh, myself and for a number of people that are my friends and fellow travelers for the last 40 years in this profession that um, have white beards or the equivalent. Now, we've lived through some uh, interesting changes in these, these past 40 years, and I'd like to try to contextualize what we're up to, um, and then in doing so, um, offer a few, a few thoughts as to 
what's our next steps in regard. And all I can do is, um, uh, you know, to an ec ecumenicalism, if you will, as to how we'd approach this and then share something of my own view about what, what would come next. And I'm really interested to hear uh, what everybody else thinks about this and then discover maybe a few fellow travelers in our, in our conversation. Um, as I was thinking about this, what, what struck me is that we are witnessing the second uh, coming of the human relationship in our field. Um, and for folks, you know, that knew me when I had hair and my beard was black, uh, I encountered this field in the human relations movement. Uh, and, and that's what drew me to it. Um, and in fact, um, I remember having a, a lunch with Chris Argers, who was an early, uh, 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 I don't know, disciple, prophet <laughs> to me of some kind. And he, he wrote a book called uh, Integrating the Individual in the Organization in 72. And that caught my eye. And that's that book I told him at lunch. That's why I'm in the field. I was really, really interested in how uh, we could deal with, uh, and here's a, a gender alert just to give you a sense of the time. Um, uh, Bob, you know, I'd read Bob Guest's book, Man on the Assembly Line. I had read White's organization. I had steeped myself in Blauner and Alien Free. It was, it was all about how we're going to deal with bureaucracies and uh, long link technologies and, and all of that and trying to find our humanity in the workplace. Um, that was the, the promise. That's what drew me here. And then um, arrived in business school. Um, and enter uh, the neoliberal movement, but really enter globalization. Uh, and that changed everything. Uh, and so uh, the unit of analysis in our field changed from uh, the individual as a dependent variable um, embedded in these contexts that were uh, alienating sources of estrangement and anomia uh, to figure out how these are gonna um, survive, if not thrive in a, in a global economy. Uh, and so we've had a uh, 30 to 40 year run of dealing with all aspects of um, the competitive dynamics of globalization that has just unfolded right, right in front of our faces um, over, the, over time. Uh, just again, I, just, I, I went to the Strategy Doctoral Consortium in 1983, I don't know, two, one, there. Uh, SMJ was founded in 1980. The SMS, I don't know, I, I presume was founded in 1980. The field didn't even exist prior to that. You know, we, we just, and that's just part of the air we breathe, but we had just, we we're coming to terms with the competitive uh, our realities of market competition. Um, and so uh, as things moved along, we had that all of that was dogged by the CSR movement. We were saying, hey, wait a minute, on the other side of the globalization, we were now exposed to each other in ways that we hadn't been prior and, uh, and, and coming to appreciate our common humanity in and through work, which was a, a different kind of uh, question than, than we encountered that, uh, when we entered the field in the 70s, I, I suppose, for those of us that did. Um, and that, that's been head spinning um, to try to make sense of this. And we've been fighting with the, the cooperation competition tension for all these years. Uh, but then we're also now straining to come to terms with completely different levels of analysis in our work. Just reflect back, it was all individuals, groups, organizations. Then I remember industry came in and what are we gonna make of that in strategic groups? And then along was institutions. And then there we sat and then now it's society, humanity and the planet. And we're dealing with existential risk and the Anthropocene and speed extinction and these super wicked problems that you're talking about and the grand challenges and the, and the SDGs that are now a part of our, my performance appraisal in the University of Michigan every year. Thank you, Jerry Davis for this, but every year, um, have to our research and teaching informs our, our quest to, uh, you know, achieve the SDGs and, and, you know, hit those targets. This is a completely different world. Um, and it's one fraught now with this, the is ought tension is just very much in play. Um, and a lot of the stimulus for this meeting is we were going to talk about uh, ourselves as scholars and what does, what does all of this mean for us? Um, and I can just point and see Anne is on this, this, uh, this call and God bless her. She's been working with, with so many others for the Responsible Research and Business and Management Initiative, uh, orienting our research toward, and the tag that I wrote down this morning, a science business and a better world. Uh, that's a promise of what we're up to. 
Um, I just joined the, the board of uh, Prime Principles for Responsible Management Education. And so this sense of how can we bring this, in, this sensibility into the classroom. This is where we find ourselves and we're dealing with these incredible problems at a system level of the kind that Anita is talking about with immigration and the exploitation that's attended to it and Paul's issues that are cosmically grand where we're now interrogating um, uh, capitalism uh, and, and then what's our role in it? Um, I thought that I wasn't uh, in Ann Arbor when Paul came through, but uh, he mentioned at the end, you know, we're going to use our understanding of strategic management to help organize the world and Kaiser Permanente, at least in his book, was a, was a template for that. And so there's a, there's a role in play there. Um, but for me, oddly enough, the more macro our questions become and our, our uh, yearning uh, resides, if that's a, a phrase, and it's not. Um, the more the micros is just mad at me, and I can't, uh, I can't quite shake it. I, and for a while, I couldn't figure out why, um, because my, as you meet grand, grand challenges with grand solutions, um, and you, I'm looking for systems level um, uh, interventions. Um, but suddenly, the individual just started mattering more and more, and I started to think about. Uh, it's the flip side of the. Donaldson and I wrote where we were trying to come to terms with the endless stakeholder shareholder debate that I just could not figure out. Grace Augustine on the call. Years ago, I developed a course that just made me think I came up with some thought. Actually, capture the, 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 the solution uh, fallacies of compositions. Uh, a fallacy of composition that a theory of the firm does not constitute a theory of the business, a theory of the part does not constitute a theory of the whole. So now we're worried about climate change and species extinction and poverty and inequality and, and all the rest. Um, we're starting to worry about a fallacy of division where we come up with uh, solutions of all and then we want to be careful to say, well, what does that mean for the, at the individual level or for the, for the part? Um, and I think we need to simultaneously worry about the kinds of um, uh, interventions that Anita are talking about with these, these, these broad um, questions and, and subject, subjected to our research, but also think about what's the individual uh, substrate to all of this. Um, and because uh, all these grand plans will just completely fall on, on um, neoliberal years, <laughs> if you will, if, if you still have a conception of self as what's it called? The entrepreneur of self. <laughs> That's the, the, the t shirt line of what neoliberalism, at least in neoliberalism, at least as my conception. So if you have, I, I found myself drawn to questions of values and worldviews. If your value is oriented toward masters and, master and dominance and ego, and your, um, and your worldview is, or is zero sum dualistic, uh, no matter what we do at the macro level, you're still gonna encounter these self-seeking agents, if you will, as to how they're, they're running their world. And I grant you a lot of that is determined by the context, um, but then the sense um, to honor by the International Human, uh, Humanistic Management Association's uh, foundation principles of respect to dignity and the like, say, well, what if the values were, um, uh, grounded in relationships rather than self, if they were grounded in risk rather than mastery, if they were grounded in humility rather than pride. And those were the set of values or in our, our, our lives and our social life. Um, and those were the guiding principles, what would the world look like? And um, uh, with respect to our worldviews, and there's literature on all this, I'm using these words sort of preciously, but um, you know, instead of zero sum, it's positive sum. Instead of <laughs> dualism, it's non-dualism. Uh, and if you have that's your assumption about our physical and social world, we have a chance of um, of reaching the kinds of solutions we're we're hoping for with these problems. Um, so where are we? Um, I think we're really good at in our field. We can savage the neoliberalism of of our uh, recent decades. We can critique, um, you know, selfishness and non-dualistic thinking. It's a whole nother story to articulate what it is we want um, from each other and for each other. And then we get, to, then it gets a little fraught and it also doesn't sit well with science. Um, out as an assertion. 
Um, so then our challenge is as to what we do as scholars if we are going to attend to these super wicked grand challenges um, at the pro level, at the most macro level, but then also at the, um, at the level of meaning the values and worldviews perhaps to accommodate this world that we hope to, to inhabit or we hope our progeny will inhabit. Um, what do we do? Um, and I think on the research front, well, we just started to see this aiming its, um, toward normative science, and that could seem like an oxymoron, but I think we're heading there. I think that's why field experiments are so popular, and they're just all over economics and absolutely coming into our world in a big way. Um, and then our teaching, I think that's where this, this is where this has hit the, hit the ground, I think, in the last number of years. That we're, we're fairly, uh, fairly comfortable with the tagline is always teaching for transformation. Uh, people try to do that to open up people's values and worldviews. Um, but we still have to say what it is we're trying to, to achieve. Um, and I think that's the challenge of, of our time is to uh, I'll just play with Weber, but free us of, <laughs> free us of the, the, the iron cage that imprisons our conceptions of ourselves. Uh, as selves and as as people in interaction with others, um, and then the question is, what exactly is a research agenda to um, help understand descriptively how we find ourselves in the situation where we are, uh, and then normatively how we for ourselves um, with and through our scholarship. Um, I'm not quite sure, but that's my quest. Um, Thank you. Um, Again, just briefly, I want to, to share how grateful I am that everyone's here. Um, I had a chance while Jim was talking to quickly scroll through um, all of our participants. Um, and I just felt so energized that you're all here to be problem solvers or opportunity horizon warriors. Um, so thank you again. And um, I wanna give our panelists actually an opportunity to dialogue with each other a little bit. I saw a couple, I think Anita had a question for Paul and I think Jim, you may have provoked some uh, questions or ideas from Paul and Anita as well. Maybe you have some questions. I just want to open it up to you three to chat with each other just for a short time. Then I have a couple more questions and then we'll facilitate a Q&A with the audience. So Anita, I saw that you'd raised a question for Paul. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks for everything here. Um, my dear friends, Jim and Paul, uh, it's wonderful to be here with you and as ever. So Paul, I wanted to I wanted to ask you if you could help me. So I'm persuaded. So Paul and I have been talking about this book for years. And I'm persuaded that uh, the idea that government would have a coherent plan and move away from this ping pong of short soundbite like political statements that never get implemented in a coherent policy. I'm increasingly persuaded that that's, that that's, that there's, that's attractive. But can you help me internalize how handing the keys to the car to the Trump administration, say, is going to help us, you know, solve those six problems? Don't we, aren't you worried about whether or not the governments have the capabilities and drive and commitment to social justice necessary to be able to fulfill the vision that you've, that, that, that you've, you know, laid out. I'm, I'm worried about whether or not, you know, sure, I trust Charlie Baker, a Republican governor here in Massachusetts, based on what he's done in COVID, but he's done some other stuff around education policy that has me really worried, for example. <laughs> do I give him the keys to the car? How do we deal with this? Yeah. I didn't think I was going to come away from this conversation and have nightmares, but you just gave me Wow. Oh, I'm so sorry. Handing <laughs> the keys of our national economy to Trump. Man, I'm going to have to process that one. Um, so, but good question. Or Putin yes. or, yeah. you know, yeah. so, I mean, yeah. or, or even Johnson. Like, look at Boris Johnson, who I think is got a different set of constraints than some of these others. But what I'm trying to say is that there's, it seems to me that government is as broken as anything. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, it slowly dawned on me as I was working on this book, as, you, as Anita said, I mean, it's been in gestation for quite a while, um, that the 
problem with the idea of democratic socialism didn't actually have much to do with socialism. It had everything to do with people's faith in democracy. Um, we claim our adherence to democracy as if it's a sort of self-evident uh, proposition. But when you scratch the surface, many people express the kinds of concerns that you do, Anita, which is, well, hold on a second, democracy hasn't been proven so robust. Do we want to really empower these uh, representatives of ours to control even more of our lives, given what a terrible job they've done with it so far, the limited power they've had so far. Um, so I'd say a couple of things. First, I can't expect democracy to yield much for us when we're still living with a f essentially capitalistic economic core. The weight of, in of business interests over government policy is just inescapable. And that's not, a, that's not fundamentally a question of money and politics and lobbying power and things that we could change through regulation. It's because any government, even the most progressive government, is going to be constrained by the interests of the business sector. They can't afford to put many businesses out of business, right, and, and undercut their own legitimacy and the economic vitality of the society that they're governing. And so, you know, but, and that's on the progressive end of the spectrum, on the, you know, on, in, just in the regular play of our societies, business interests have massive sway over government policy and absolutely under no circumstances do I want to empower government to control more of our lives under those circumstances. If, on the other hand, we transform private property into socialized property, right? And now we're managing all of these enterprises as public enterprises. So now we're in a different space. Now we have to imagine how, would, how well could democracy work on such a vast scale, um, given now that government can operate, our democratic processes can operate without this immense counterweight of the business sector's private profit interests. So that's a difficult task of imagination on our part. Why, what, what, Eric, is it okay if I ask you, uh, if I ask a quick follow up? Okay. Um, why wouldn't redistribution work, work as well? In other words, why not have, um, you know, a minimum level of income for everybody, higher taxes? Wouldn't, would that accomplish the same outcome? It can't. Not, I mean, I, I took, I tried to work through the tiny example of the environmental crisis we face the kinds of changes we need to make to respond to the environmental crisis are not, um, we, we're not, we can't get there under, uh, through those sorts of adjustments, through those sorts of regulatory changes. I would say the same thing about economic crises. That no society, social democratic or neoliberal, has avoided cr the, the crushing effects of economic crisis and mass unemployment uh, on a durable basis. Uh, Sweden, uh, Denmark, all these countries have had serious massive waves of unemployment and, the, and youth unemployment is, is off the charts. The, the integration of those societies into the broader world economy has completely undercut the ability of those social democratic governments to control their own economic systems. And, I, and in a world of interdependence, I don't see how it can be otherwise. So. Uh, so let's assume we've turned all these private enterprises into public enterprises. Now you've got this interesting challenge of imagining how democracy can work when it's expanded from the political, narrow political sphere we see today to encompass the planning of a whole economy. Could that work? I, I think it can, yeah, why, why wouldn't it? I mean, that would be not obvious, um, I grant, that it requires a lot of work and a lot of institutional uh, innovation, of it, absolutely. But why would why we be begin with the premise that democracy wouldn't be applicable on such a broad range of, of issues? It doesn't require superhuman intelligence. It doesn't require people to be different than what they are. It just requires the institutional context to be different. That might be a link to some of the ideas that Jim was offering. Yeah. You know, this idea of governance and uh, yeah. just changing the governance arrangements and you get a different outcome. Yes, absolutely. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. So, uh, Jim, um, Jim. Tell, uh, do you, you seem to think, tell us a bit more, if you would, Jim, about why you're feeling like uh, our internal compasses uh, are so unreliable and, uh, and so problematic at this point. I, I, I'm not quite seeing the huge stumbling block that you are. You've thought deeply about this. I'm eager to understand better yeah. the, the, the dilemma that you feel yourself confronting. 
Uh, well, the dilemma, I guess, is there's a, there's a couple of them. One is um, just even the, the exchange you just had with Anita, I'm, um, and I've also been privileged, <laughs> I'm, I'm reflecting back on the conversations I've had with you as trying to be a fast follower over the, the decades, because um, I was never trained to, um, uh, you know, set a few political science classes here and there, and uh, I read Marx and Weber, et cetera, like any other good organization theorist. I'm not formally trained in, in that level of analysis, if you will. Um, so when we start talking about uh, reforming um, basic institutions of economies, and things, um, I'm not quite sure what to say or how to enter those conversations just because of my ignorance will far outstrip any insight I have. So part of what I'm trying to do is think about, well, we're, uh, for those of us that are uh, teaching in business schools, and maybe that's just, I'll get out of business schools, but if we're teaching in business schools, where the, the units of analysis um, are individuals, groups, organizations, uh, industries, and maybe institutions. This is all this other um, orientation is new. Uh, and our institutions are institution theory is where we come in and that's a different kind of, it's not the nouns that you're talking about so much. And so I feel like we're unprepared to really, and, and at least for many of us on this call, not, not all, there's 200 people here, 182, are unprepared to enter those conversations about how to structure political economy of the world. Um, but we are pretty familiar with um, life and organizations and human, human life and, and its relationship to groups. And so it's at that level, I find myself just, um, I don't know, just, just, just that the sense, and, I, and this is the paradox, that we get overwhelmed by context. And so these worldviews and values that we, we inhabit in these days, I think can be traced to um, broad kinds of dynamics that you're articulating. Um, but somehow I have the sense that the only way we're gonna get out from, from all of this is to change our orientation um, uh, to how we uh, encounter with each other and work with um, others rather than having, you know, using others as our uh, ends and, and our own uh, aims of life. Um, and that's something that's tractable to us. We, we, we encounter um, our students in the classroom and we can, we can at least problematize the values and worldviews they have and to the extent to which they go out and can have the power to shape institutions and organizations, uh, we, have, we have some influence there. So one is a sense of agency, uh, uh, trying to just deal with my own sense of impotence, I suppose, and saying, well, there's, there's a place where we can make a difference. And two, maybe it's the idea that lives are lived one at a time. We have to pay attention to those individual lives if we have any hope of saving ourselves. Yeah. Well, I think there's That's a connection. The intuition. There's an, yeah. I think, a fascinating connection between the issues you're raising and these broader structural issues that uh, Anita's talking about or I'm talking about at different levels. Um, I was just reading a great article in Harper's Magazine about uh, the source of Trump's support amongst um, formerly Democratic Party voters and, in, and unionized Democratic voters. And the bottom line of, the, of this journalist's investigation um, was that um, any sense of shared purpose has disappeared even from these union members' lives. They've come to see the world as a matter of sort of each person for themselves. Um, and that that's, that they didn't, joined the union 30 years ago with that ethos, but that's the way it's seemed. They voted democratic for many years in the, with a sense that, you know, a new government could express something of their shared aspirations, and they lost faith in the Democratic Party with successive neoliberal type leaders that we've had over the years for that party. And that there's a, such, a, it's such a fascinating interconnection between the lack of meaningful political leadership at the national level and the and these people's individual everyday lives where they're interacting with each other in such instrumental terms uh, outside the narrow confines of their family unit um, and the moral bankruptcy of their lives, the, the lack of sense of, the, it, the inability to express a sense of interdependence with others, the, the inability of, of the, the lack of an institutional structure that could make, me, make concrete any sense of shared purpose in their lives had really just corroded the, the meaning of life for them. And so when a demagogue like Trump comes along, they love it because, you know, he's the, you know, he's the demon of destruction and we want to destroy everything. These lives become so meaningful. 
meaningless, I should say. Um, so I, I do think the, 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 the very personal questions you're putting are, are very meaningful to people around us and in our own lives. So thank you for raising that. And I just wanna build from that just briefly and give each of you the opportunity, you're each past presidents of the academy what is our responsibility in this? Uh, we as management scholars um, at whatever um, stages of our careers we might be, um, are we collectively part of the problem of wicked problems in our academy? What can we do to change that? Um, this has come up in the chat by several people. What's the role of business schools, of business curricula? Um, but how ultimately can we each and we collectively as business scholars become better stewards um, of our world? You wanna call on one of us? Sure, uh, Jim, what do you think? I'm all like all, the only thing that pops into my head is, uh, and for those of you that know me know that I was forever taken by, um, a law review article that was written 30 or 40 years ago, which is the definition of a scholar as someone who finds the uh, general and the particular. Um, and so um, all we can do is do what um, the 181 of us are doing now, which is uh, alone and together strain to find the bigger picture that's going on here and not respond to the proximate stimuli that face us every day, is to try to see what are the, what are the currents of history that are flowing throwing flowing through our time uh, trying to understand the dynamics that are at play that are revealing themselves to us and the signs and symptoms of, of decay and um, and worse right at the moment um, and and do that in our own work and then bring that sensibility to our students um, so that we can see see the texture of our lives and then somehow um, uh, and this gets into the aughts is articulate a better vision for ourselves and humanity um, uh, and we will do that alone and together. Um, but it's, it's to, start to see that bigger picture. Um, the only thing I think we've got going for us. Anita, do you have- And then bring in, yeah, full stop, okay. okay. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I agree entirely. And yet I also see some specific next steps that I wanted to um, perhaps put out there in case they're useful to anyone. First is that for senior scholars who write a lot of tenure letters, edit journals, write a lot of reviews, and um, run departments, get involved in uh, hiring decisions, I, I think we, we need to be uh, open to taking some, some uh, different approaches. We have created a situation where young scholars are so bound uh, by this fearsome prospect of not getting tenure that they constrain themselves to click through publications. They pick narrow problems. I can't stand going to these doctoral consortiums in which mid-level scholars convey this advice to junior scholars to set aside their passions and write publishable papers. And, you know, uh, it's just a tragedy, I think, of our profession. We have to support the individual. And so the invitation is for anybody who is reviewing a paper, writing a tenure letter, to give a little bit of uh, humanity to the, to the case and to the project and to you know, say yes more, basically, and to embrace a little bit more diversity of perspective and a little less programmatic action in the way that people move through their careers in this profession. Uh, so that's one piece. For junior scholars, please don't give, I, I see some junior scholars here, please don't give the most wonderful and valuable years of your life to, um, to a profession that you don't feel is going to be able to uh, support your values. I want you to be you <laughs> and to enact your ideas and find ways and places uh, to express yourself uh, uh, and, and, and to pursue what you feel is important and to demand really that, um, all of us uh, make the world a sustainable place where you and your your uh, the generations that follow you can can flourish. This is uh, th this is this is a requirement. I, I think there's there, for me, Jim. I, I would love. I haven't talked with you about this. I would love to talk with you about this whenever uh, the time is right. Uh, 
I increasingly see organizations as tools for getting things done that are in the service of uh, humanity and our ecosystems more generally has been a robust conversation in the chat about the natural environment. Um, we have to be stewards, uh, not just of ourselves, but of everything. <laughs> and, uh, I, you know, I, organizations are tools for getting that done. And that's uh, why I am very open to Paul's ideas. I just want to make sure that the individuals that we give the car keys to can fulfill the promise that he sees in different organizational arrangements that moving between uh, levels of units of analysis between the individual, between the organizational governance mechanisms, and then uh, uh, the intertemporal implications for the planet, for all of us. For me, that's that's the conversation, you know. Um, uh, so uh, I think we need to find ways to enact our humanity in the profession and write about what we see as important and uh, not follow these rules that are so nuts and 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 constraining and you know uh, uh, and life sucking you know <laughs> we have to we have to do a better job for each other Paul did you want to add anything uh yeah uh, uh, first just a little comment there's a lot of terrific stuff happening in the chat but i find these webinars uh, very stressful because when i'm in them as a panelist and in the conversation I can't do a process like that. So um, if anyone wants to engage me in conversation about any of this stuff, please just email me or I'll download the chat when we're done and I'm happy to engage the conversation. But um, I'm much, if, you know, I'm so interested in what Jim and Anita have to say, I just can't do a process. So I don't, I try to ignore the chat. Part. Um, but on the substance here, um, I just want to uh, second uh, Anita's emotion here. Um, We've, we talk a lot in our business about the institutional constraints on creative, meaningful research, the A journal fetish, num counting publications for tenure and all the rest of it. All of that's real and I wish I had a solution for it. I wish I had, you know, in my role at the Academy of Management been able to make even the slightest dent in, in those institutional realities. Nothing, nada, zero, zip. Um, there nevertheless is, I've come around to the conclusion, like Anita, that there's still an enormous scope for individual agency as for, um, on our part. Whether you're a PhD student, a junior faculty member, a senior faculty member, there's lots of space as an academic for you to bring your values, to screw up your courage and bring your values into your work and make this meaningful. No, the path that is, is, is recommended by these uh, folks that Anita was disparaging, <laughs> offering offering such sage advice about how to make sure that the problems are so narrowly construed they can make their way to an age journal. Yeah, uh, we, they, those constraints are not in, in, insuperable. And we should encourage people to recognize that they have individual agency as junior or senior scholars in doing work that matters. Um, on the teaching side, I, I, I do think we have an interesting opportunity here. It's true that our major stakeholder, the corporate world into which most of our graduates are, 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 are going to be moving, is not much interested in a critique of the society as it stands today. Um, on the other hand, the students we're, taught, we're teaching are headed into middle management roles. Uh, they're not headed into the C-suite. Eventually, maybe, they all hope to be, but their next 10 years of their lives, if not more, are going to be as middle managers, where they are dealt, where they deal with these contradictions every day. The reality of racial oppression, of gender, of gender discrimination, the reality of the sort of tension between capitalistic profit and the welfare of the communities in which the firm is embedded. Those are real features of the manager's everyday life. And we need as teachers to be able to give them tools with which to understand that. In my world, in my role as a teacher, I, I, I refuse absolutely to preach. So I'm very proud of the fact at the end of my course on business government society, students have no idea whether I, which of the four main perspectives I introduce them to. We spend the semester thinking about the world through the lens of Milton Friedman, then sort of a more regulated capitalism vision of like a Paul Krugman, uh, and then a more ethical capitalism vision associated, you might imagine associated with someone like Charles Handy, you know, and then we read a little slab of the Communist Manifesto and read a bunch of socialist stuff. So we have these four points of view. And at the end of the semester, my students don't have a clue whether I'm closer to Karl Marx or Milton Friedman. And that gives me, that's a treat for me because 
my goal is to encourage them to think critically about the world. It's not to preach. But if we can expose them to the, to the broader range of discussions that are happening every day in the business pages, let alone the front parts of the newspaper, um, we give them tools with which to make sense of their lives as managers and as citizens. And I don't think this is an insuperable problem in business schools um, uh, from a teaching point of view either. So let me, I should stop there. Thank you. Um, I have several more questions. We have about a half an hour to go and I, I can still add some of my questions, but I think it's good timing to open this up a little bit. And again, I've been following the chat and it is rich. Um, and I also haven't been able to dual process as much as I'd like to, but um, just to make sure everyone hears this, we will make the chat available. Please give us a couple of days. The formatting is really clunky in the raw version, so we will do that for you. Um, and we'll get this out to everyone in addition to the video recording. Um, and please do, I think everyone here, uh, whether you're an audience member, a panel member, participant in general, I think everybody is, I'm assuming everybody's open to continuing this conversation with each other. So do reach out. Um, Okay, so um, I have seen so many questions, so many comments that are so great. I actually wanna start with one that was very early in the session that Sunitha asked, and I think it's critical. Um, so Sunitha, are you there? This is regarding the converted versus the unconverted. Are, are you there? Would you like to ask that question? Thank you, Erika. So I always wonder, sir, that you know when we join all these groups and we listen, it's always from, you know, we're always already converted to the idea about what needs to be done to the world and how the world has to change. But then I always, I don't know how I can change or influence the others who are not in this kind of thinking. How do I approach them and how do I influence their thought process? Because they come from a totally different worldview and a totally different belief system. You know, can I quickly jump in here, Erica? Andy Hoffman has a great book on, on this. Uh, that I recommend to you, Andrew Hoffman from one of Jim's colleagues from the University of Michigan. He, he, it's about climate change, a very small book. And what he talks about is the internalized understanding of each side of the pro and anti-climate change um, agenda. And he talks about why uh, the two sides are talking past each other and there's, there's no movement on the conversation. And uh, it has to do with very different core beliefs about what, um, what's happening and why, and whether or not uh, scientific um, uh, arguments are valid in, uh, in, in, in understanding the future. But the reason that yes. climate change, that 97% of people believe that climate change is now real, I think it's 97%, according to some poll that I recently read, is because actual civil dialogue across the big middle works. Actually trying to listen to people and figure out where you disagree. And, you know, I made this argument in my presidential uh, address for the academy that as academics, it's part of our responsibilities in society to support that civil d discourse, that dialogue, to not to not yell at each other, <laughs> to figure out ways to try to understand what's happening and, and, to, and to deepen our listening by actually doing research to understand the social processes and so on behind uh, someone's uh, point of view. That's why I was uh, so interested in that Harper's article that Paul just recommended because you know, you were, it helped you in a sense understand uh, the multiplicity of views uh, uh, and, and, and that's sort of, I think, at the heart of what we do is, to, is the Toyota five questions really are about asking, you know, why and then asking why to the why back five layers, really trying to understand where other people are coming from. And that I see is our opportunity. And that's both in our classrooms and in, the, and in our writing and in the world. Thank you. Paul, did you want to add anything or? Thumbs up. Thumbs up. That's exactly the right answer. I, 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 maybe the United States is surely in a worse place than most other parts of the at least advanced economies uh, in the level of mutual distrust and disdain. And um, it, it serves no great 
constructive purpose to entrench ourselves in these def defensive positions. And we, you know, especially if you've got confidence in your own beliefs and you're willing to and you're willing to learn something, um, you know, open a conversation. Try to understand where people are coming from. Um, it's um, I, I think that's the only path. Just a, a, a quick observation, just to follow on, and, and <clears throat> I'd like to have Sunita for, for you to have the last word on this. This is your question, and usually, the person asking a question has some sense of the answer <laughs> when they're asking the question. But um, uh, I sometimes wonder if we put too much uh, 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 credence in our writing. I don't, I don't know how many people read actually, and to your point, do people collectively read. Um, so I find that. Um, uh, over time. That's why teaching seems to matter, but then you get versus elective issues and people are still self-selecting, but, um, but somehow it has to be in, in dialogue and in conversation with others. Um, and it can either be uh, articulated or uh, perhaps there's some role modeling and there's vicarious learning to be, to be had here. But um, the sense is, is uh, people learn from lots of different ways besides just reading. And so that's how we possibly encounter others where we can share our curiosity and, and share our, our first principles and our world vision, our worldviews and our values uh, with each other and then try to try to learn. I think it's, it's dialogical. It's, it's, it's in a community somehow as we're going to do this. Um, and our, our reflex because of who we are and what we do is to try to mind around these issues and then say something and then send that out to the world. But I, um, but I'm thinking it's how can we figure out how we can encounter others uh, in dialogue and then it may also be things like this modalities besides the written word um, and I, I've lived by the written word but <laughs> I sometimes wonder if we're just sending this stuff out into you know, into an echo chamber and, quick, and, quick pitch for uh, reading fiction matter. and reading outside our field too exactly I'm just exactly. reading this really uh, a uh, great book on immigration called Go, Go Gone. I'll put, I'll give it, get it out to you later, uh, a little bit later. Go, Go Going Gone, which is about immigration. It's about a professor who encounters a group of immigrants and under, starts to understand in an entirely new way what immigration is. To, to that, just in my own life, I've, I've noticed that I read books now far, far more than I read articles. And earlier in my career, I was reading articles and never read a book. Um, and so um, I don't know what that means. Um, and, and like you, um, I try to read pretty broadly. Um, so Aria, Ariana um, is on the call, and I know you. Sunifa, though, what do you think? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Sunitha, are you still there? Yeah. I think Jim oh, is wondering, wondering about your strategies. I'm still reflecting on them because for me, in the place that I am in, in India, it's a huge struggle. It's a huge struggle to get to look at people, uh, look at things differently. The minute you talk differently, you're esoteric. You don't fit in. You know, so it's, it's very difficult. Uh, so in, in fact, therefore, I was uh, looking for some sort of an answer. But yeah, but I guess... Figure out, figuring out the dialogue across differences uh, is hard when someone says, I only want money. I only want uh, whatever are the economic metrics, whether it in the academics, okay, the citation score, if I talk that for academics or it's the corporations where we say, this is what I want. I need money. What's the bottom line? So what's in it for me? So then for me, that dialogue becomes very difficult because it's in two opposite poles of a spectrum. So that's what my struggle is. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Thank you. And I, I see there's been conversation too about the paradox um, of systems versus human centric and how do we hold these and transcend them. Thank you, Judy Neal, for that comment. Um, and I think we're in deep in that paradox and throughout this whole conversation. Um, Jason, I see that you had responded to a comment that Paul had made about um, the students we're in touch with and where their likely impact is. Do you want to just chat for a second about that? If you have a question or yeah. well, I just sure. Eric. I, I just made the comment that uh, you know I, I'm at a 
uh, upper Midwestern <laughs> program that, uh, you know, is sitting in the Twin Cities. And yeah, most of our students are going to go to middle management positions if they're not in that already. And this is more to build for years down the road. But the discussion that we usually have, you know, and we think about uh, uh, the old one, Milton Friedman, but even Greg Mankiw's editorial the other day in the New York Times is aimed at the C-suite, yet the people that we're teaching are dealing with real ethical issues every day that are impacting real people and real communities that that they're in right and and that that could be a place where some of the discussion um, allows us to really change the focus because we're dealing with people who are facing those types of decisions on a daily basis yeah th thank you for that, that was a very interesting op-ed piece by Mankiw. I thought it was a subtle updating of Milton Friedman's old argument. Um, and um, we've been waiting for someone to restate it in more contemporary language for a while. Those of us who teach this sort of stuff in our classes. Um, and pretty sad point of view, but yes, um, expresses an important vantage point. Um, I do think that within these firms uh, 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 that, our student, that our students graduate to work in, they, they do, uh, they're, they live, they don't just live these problems as managers they're responsible for sort of two strands of activity that are in, 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 interpenetrated they're, they're at the one on the one side they are effective productively coordinating ac the activity of other people and on the other hand they're vehicles for exploiting them and screwing them over and those two things are deeply intertwined in the in the everyday work of a of a manager in a capitalist corporation and just helping people think about that the tensions within uh, the, the the enterprise within which they work within society where they live i think that we, we can play an important role there and maybe to go back to sunita's point um you know it, the ideas when you have these different ideas about the way society is uh, could be working or should be working um sometimes you feel as if we all feel as if they're they're in our head they're our ideas but for the main part these ideas are already out there in social movements of various kinds and so engaging a conversation with our students about the meaning of these movements what sense do we give to the aspirations being expressed by these movements uh, that I think opens up very interesting opportunities for real dialogue and discussion and expanding people's horizons and perspectives. Great, thank you. So I I'm, feel very fortunate to have uh, some colleagues who have been dual processing. So I know Michael might have some things to summarize and David Wasilewski also uh, may have some comments and may have uh, noted one or two people who have some questions. So I'm gonna turn it over first to Michael. Yeah, so the, the, the discourse in the chat has been indeed quite alive <laughs> and sometimes heated in, in, in possible ways, which, which may not be a bad sign. It's actually probably the, the, a good sign in terms of how much this conversation energizes. And I think Anita and others were talking about we need our energy. We need to sort of re-energize ourselves possibly. And if that's the conversation that we can have here, it's great. One key sort of uh, point seems to be what do what would you think in terms of us as being human and our role in the academy how can we energize our students the people that we work with the the how can we use our platform to help us see a new way of being and what would you draw on what perspective there's this conversation of anthropocentric it's bad we need to be uh, other centric etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and 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 there probably is a lot of truth in all of this and i'm wondering if we share the right vocabulary that can help us collaborate versus just sort of like loggerheads but um what is your sense anita paul and and, and jim what are the ways that you can get at that? How can you energize? What are some of the best takeaways that you see our academy and maybe beyond uh, really contribute quickly? You know, one of my um, mentors, Adam Brandenberger from NYU, when I was a doctoral student said, you really have to know yourself. And, uh, and he recommended thinking about what excited you when you were uh, young, you know, an undergraduate or maybe a high school student. What, what are some of the core ideas and the core themes in your own life that motivate you, that got you excited when you were, when you were, when you were taking a fresh look at what the world had to offer? Um, 
and and to return to those whenever you're in doubt of how to you know get energy and to, and to figure out how to move forward you know we'll have a diversity of approaches among us one thing we've done with your amazing support michael and erica and sandra and david in having a humanistic management association is provide each other with support for that kind of initiative uh, you know, a, a, a safe place that we can talk about these things, not buffeted by uh, questions of basic legitimacy, <laughs> you know, such as uh, we might encounter in our, in, our, in, our, um, in, in, in our institutions or in our societies more broadly. But really, really privileging your own, your own internal um, sort of compass, I would say, is a place to get energy. Um, let, let me take a shot at it, uh, maybe. Um, I like uh, humanism as an orienting device isn't a, a phrase that comes naturally to me, but I love what you have done with it. Um, and I do think it's a very powerful way of thinking, uh, of helping think, people think about the world and what our roles in it should be. Um, you know, part of the challenge that I think Sunita was pointing to, she mentioned in passing people who think that life's all about just enriching themselves. Um, and I think that the, the, what struck me in conversation with students and colleagues who think like that and friends who think like that is that it's, a not, it's not a generalizable proposition. When you, when you meet someone who says, you know, people are only in it for themselves, they should only be in it for themselves, you know, anything else is just cheap talk. Um, if you just sit them down and try to engage a conversation about, well, what would the world look like if that were actually the case? Um, is that the kind of world you want to live in? And the answer is almost invariably no. They're, they're writing opportunistically on the goodwill of others when they say they want to be self-interested. <clears throat> and you know, humanism calls on us to recognise the humanity in others, and to and to and to think about the generalizability of these ethical precepts. Um, and so, one thing we can do, I think, uh, there's a lovely book by a philosopher by the name of Harry Frankfurt on bullshit. And bullshit is a technical term that he introduced into contemporary philosophy, meaning you say stuff of the truth value of which you actually don't care about. Um, and we have a lot of bullshit in our conversations, in, as in academia, in our classrooms, in our publications, where people don't actually mean what they say. And if you sit them down and call the bullshit and say, well, hold on a second, what, what do you really mean by that? Is that really what you think? Um, that often opens up an important conversation. Jim, did you want to add anything? I, when you were speaking, uh, you were breaking up and then uh, Zoom just crashed on me. <laughs> so I never heard your question. Um, Welcome back. Uh, yeah. Michael, do you want to just quickly? Well, I think any comment that you have, and, and I know, Jim, you have thought about this and you have practiced this in your classes, but I, uh, I just want to make sure uh, all of us here have a certain role that we can play. Anita and Paul and Jim, when you say something, it does give legitimacy to certain ways that others intuit uh, how they could be in the classroom, but we're sort of struggling to make sense of the bigger world, what is legitimate within the academy, and I think Anita spoke to that. The question is more about how do we energize each other and the students or maybe the, the broader society that we can influence, that we can speak to, certainly through writing, but also in the way how we see ourselves and others and what are some ways that we can we can make, well, be more quote unquote powerful in a good sense in empowering and enlivening others. So I'm, I'm just leaving it at that. that. Jim, are you still there? Yeah, I guess um, what, what comes to mind, I, I turn my video off, maybe it's bandwidth, but I, there's a 160 people <laughs> videos coming in. But um, uh, this goes back to uh, Anita's uh, comment about the academy and the audit culture and, and all of that. And then Paul's uh, plea for people to, um, to be themselves and, um, and the like. Um, uh, 
you know, we're in this together. And what, what strikes me is just reflect on whom you're drawn to, Ben Greg Brammer, in our field. Uh, and I'm drawn to Anita. I'm drawn to Paul. <laughs> I'm drawn to Michael. I'm drawn to Erica. I see Alan Meyer just popped on this. I'm drawn to Alan. I'm just looking at who I'm seeing. Uh, I don't know Bruce um, uh, uh, Kibler, but I like his questions. <laughs> I'm drawn to Bruce. <laughs> um, and then, so if you're fully present and, you, and there's no bullshit and you're engaged, you know who these people are that are just yearning to find the right questions and to figure out how to answer them. And then we just have to find each other and just, uh, and just keep expanding the, the, the conversations. Um, uh, I don't know how, how else to say it, um, but, or Anne who's back there. I mean, there's, there's so many people on this, and Sandra, there's, that just inspire me by their passion and their commitments. Uh, and, I, and, and, and then the people are vicarious sources of, of inspiration. I just watch what people do and watch them go, watch them honor their own talents and then say, all right, it's time for you to step up and do the same. Um, and then occasionally you um, sit down and have a cup of coffee with them or you chat with them in some form. Um, but we are in, we do inspire each other. You're right. We really do. Um, and so back to the Anita and Paul is just be true to your maybe i'll just add one thought to this it, it's it's i do think our, this question gets a lot more complicated when we're such an international community um within the academy of management within your international humanistic association um these all of these problems and all these discussions we're talking about opening up they are very different depending on your context and it's really hard to come up with insights that travel across those regional, cultural, political differences. Um, and, and it's a bit of a challenge. I, I've often won, wondered whether the Academy of Management won or lost uh, by becoming so international. Uh, we obviously won an enormous amount of increased diversity of thought, but <clears throat> at, the same at the same time, I think we lost the ability to really engage many of the critical discussions we need to have. And I, I, I think we, as scholars, we tend to be pretty cosmopolitan and internationalist in our outlook. That, that's the kind of the nature of what it is to be a modern academic. Um, but, um, but it creates a very real constraint on our ability to seriously talk about issues and find a language which makes sense across all these different contexts. Thank you. Um, David, I know you're there also. You've been diligently piecing together the chat. Are you? I can't see you right now, but. Yeah, uh, I think my camera's on. Uh, thanks, Erica. And gosh, um, thank you for this wonderful session. It's just an honor to be a part of it. And, and to, uh, I just really appreciate thinking with all of you here this morning. This is a great way to spend a day. Um, I, I, I'm doing some work with uh, Sandra Waddick, who's been active in the chat, on uh, reducing some of the tensions that uh, humans have with each other and with nature, and to try to find ways to reconnect uh, us with nature and with each other. So not nature in a strict environmental sense, but certainly uh, in a human sense. So I would uh, like to call on Sandra to talk about one of the ways that we talked about for reducing those tensions and her work on narratives I think is very uh, relevant here. So Sandra, would you, would you mind uh, uh, muting yourself for this? Sorry to call on you. Yeah, I, I, I've been watching your chat. Thank you. Um, well, ooh, what a surprise. Um, I was just thinking, oh, thank God I don't have to talk. Um, yeah, it seems to me that we've been stuck in a story, and we know the story. The story is one of neoliberalism, and we know its tenets. We we and, and these st stories are very powerful. So there was a conversation going on a little earlier about sort of the um, the powerful ways we think about things, and um, neoliberalism has captured us in many ways, captured the world in many ways. And for some reason, it's memes. It's the core units of culture that constructed free markets, individualism, selfish, uh, self-interest, um, uh, uh, 
and let's say fair government, all of those things have captured us. And we, we live in that story, and particularly in business schools, we live in that story, and we don't even often recognize that we're living in that story. And so what David and I have been trying to do is sort of raise up that story. And what I've done in another book that is coming out in the fall is, is really raise up that story and provide try to provide an alternative way of thinking about it. And in doing that, um, we've been drawing from a variety of sources, Eastern, uh, Eastern perspectives, um, indigenous perspectives, other ways of thinking more relationally, thinking about humans as part of nature, not as separate from nature, and what would that mean if we thought about our economic systems that way. Um, and so um, it, it's about creating, constructing an equally resonant yet different story um, that builds on a different set of meanings without necessarily, as George Lakoff was tell, was, would tell us, without, without necessarily referring to the memes that got us there in the first place. Because, um, as Lakoff says, the minute you, you sort of start using the language of, uh, of the position you're trying to counter, you've fallen into that uh, trap and you can't really get out of it. Um, I will say that there's a, I, I, I put this on chat, there's a session at the Academy of Management coming up in a couple of weeks, August 9th, 3 o'clock Eastern Time, um, that David Corton and Michael Pearson, uh, Andy Hoffman and Chris Lazo and I will be presenting, that presents uh, an alternative, a living systems view. And I'd suggest if you're interested in carrying this idea further, you look at that or you possibly buy the book that David and I have written, um, which David, I don't even remember the name of it after we changed. <laughs> but maybe you can say. Thank you. Uh -huh. Human Chain, the Paradox of Sustainability, yes. Uh, it, we talk about a lot of these issues in that book that I think are quite uh, related to the conversation here today. Thanks, Sandra. Sorry for, for uh, surprising you on the on calling right here. So I know we're almost at the end of our session. We, we've got just a few minutes left. I, I'd love to invite each of our panelists, if you have just a short final remark um, anything that you'd like to share that you have, may have been inspired by or that you'd like to leave us with um, before we close I'll, I'll give it a shot um, um, another world is possible um, who would have thought that uh, the coronavirus would have promote provoked you know the massive intervention of governments into our lives to save us, you know, to, to support us economically. Uh, in some countries, effect, uh, effectuated more, <laughs> done more effectively than others, obviously the United States being one of the laggards here, but who would have thought a few years ago or a few months ago that federal governments across so many countries would have stepped in to, to pay people's wages. The idea of guaranteed basic income was just a ridiculous outlandish idea up until three months ago when it became a truth for everybody. So my, my parting message would be, you know, let's not be too, let's be aware of how much our experience of the current arrangement shapes our imagination as to what's possible. And, and once we become aware of that, start thinking more seriously about how different a better world might look. Thank you. Anita or Jim? I, uh, I visited uh, Apple a couple of years ago and uh, had this experience. I, I, in my early career, I worked at Morgan Stanley and uh, in financial institutions in New York and um, McKinsey and so on. And it had been, it's been decades since I've worked for a corporation, a large corporation. Going back to visit Apple, I was blown away by how this incredibly cool company that's completely on fire uh, was a place that I really would not, would not flourish. As an academic, and as all of us as academics, have are so privileged by getting to work on what we find interesting, what we think is important, what our students, we believe our students need uh, to, uh, you know, understand in order to flourish themselves. For me, I was so inspired by that visit to show up more, <laughs> you know, as a teacher, as a, as a researcher, with the entirety of myself in the work and to make sure that uh, everything that I, that I do is, is, is really true to who I want to be as well as who I am. And, uh, I guess I, I, all I'd do is put out there that 
you know, all of you are so wonderful. I would, I would, the invitation is to be more you in everything that you do. And then for me, just a, a um, relatively short observation. I, I found myself in the last um, 10 years, I suppose, as I started reading books instead of articles, uh, becoming overwhelmed with the complexity of everything that's in play. Uh, and in part because the challenges now are so grand and so much uh, seemingly grander than what I, at least I thought I saw when I first started this, this, this career of mine, embraced the profession. Um, and, and so I am so drawn to Anita and Paul and, and so many others that, but that scramble my senses and, and levels of analysis and in domains that I, I can barely um, uh, intuit well enough grasp. Um, and yet that's, and that's our reality. And so um, uh, I just love the fact that, that our work matters now more than it ever has. And I think that's, that's what I take away from this. Um, and so then it's the sense of um, back to that, that other story is just um, now is the time to be, uh, well, to, to channel Erica, to be authentic, to, to realize your own uh, narrative identity, why you're doing what you're doing, uh, and then embrace these challenges. And, you're in, and it's, a, it's an opportunity for people that are bold and creative and imaginative thinkers to come up with um, uh, new ways to think about all of this, because you're not going to find it in, uh, necessarily in our past, because we haven't been grappling with these kinds of issues. Thank you. Thank you all. Deeply for interesting and ready for us. And, and let's do it. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Anita. Thank you, Paul. Thank you all for being here on behalf of the EMA team. Uh, we look forward to more gatherings, more conversations, more action, more transformation, more authenticity. Um, thank you for being vulnerable and sharing that with all of us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Be well, everyone. Thank you.